Hi, Tech. You're just in time for lunch. Greetings, men. What's on the menu for today? Looks like you're cooking up something special to hang on me. Harry's about to serve me some information on seals and gaskets, Tech. I hope you'll stick around to see that he doesn't give me a bum steer. I'm sure you don't have to worry much about that, Charlie. But I sure will stick around. Matter of fact, it wouldn't hurt all of our master technicians to know a little more about gaskets and seals. I'm afraid some of the men sort of take them for granted when they're assembling a component. There are established procedures to follow when replacing a gasket or seal. And anyone who ignores them is just asking for a comeback. A comeback makes everyone unhappy, especially the customer. So let's hear what you have to say on the subject, Harry. I'm sure it'll be of value to all of us. Thanks, Tech. Let's start with gaskets. There are many types and materials, just as there are as many shapes as there are applications. Each has a specific function based on a number of conditions. One good example is the head gasket. Over the last 30 odd years, head gaskets have undergone as many changes as the engines themselves. The basic functions are the same, but the specific requirements have dictated some definite changes in design and materials. In the early years, head gaskets were made of copper and asbestos. The soft copper worked into the machining marks and provided a good seal for the low compression engines. Engine development soon required a gasket that would be more resistant to the higher compression ratios and the resultant higher operating temperatures. So gasket manufacturers came up with a head gasket using soft steel instead of copper. What about filling in the machining marks? You said that was one of the advantages of the copper gasket. The steel was soft enough to take care of that, Charlie. The advantage of steel was that it resisted the heat and pressure better than copper. Right, Tech. At about the same time, a gasket was developed that combined the use of steel and copper. This was, and still is, used on many of the low compression truck engines. The copper sheet absorbs vibrations under heavy load conditions. As engine compression ratios began to rise, operating temperatures also rose. So a gasket of steel and asbestos was needed to withstand the additional stresses. Fortunately, machining processes improved also, so a harder steel could be used. As the compression ratios continued to increase, engine hot spots and heat dissipation became a problem, especially on overhead valve engines. And the asbestos in the gasket insulated the head from the block. So, the next head gaskets, which are still widely used, consisted of a single sheet of steel with embossed ridges at the sealing points. The ridges are designed to crush three to ten thousandths when the head bolts are tightened. One type of embossed steel gasket is coated with an aluminum alloy. As soon as the engine reaches operating temperature, this coating flows into even the smallest machining marks to form a pliable metallic seal. Another type of embossed steel gasket has a composition coating on both sides. It's a black coating that flows into the machining marks in much the same way the aluminum coating does. The aluminum or composition coating, embossed ridges, and close tolerance machining provide an excellent seal between head and block. This means that compression ratios can be raised even higher than in current engines. Now, how about some pointers on gasket replacement, Harry? Sure thing, Tech. The first thing of importance is removal of the old gasket. Always be sure that none of the gasket has stuck to the head or block. If small pieces have stuck, remove them with a scraper. Use solvent to soften carbon, shellac, or sealing compound. If you use a putty knife to scrape a head or block, be careful. You could cause small scratches, which would make the sealing job just that much tougher. The same thing applies to wire brushes, especially on aluminum surfaces. I know you should never reuse a gasket, even if it looks perfect, but I'm not sure I know exactly why. Well, of course, there's bound to be some sealer stuck to the gasket. But more important, a used gasket will not have the elasticity necessary to a good seal. That's right, Tech. When all the surfaces have been thoroughly cleaned, check them for trueness. Using a straight edge and feeler gauges, check along the length and width. 
The reference book for this session has specifications for trueness. Be sure you have the correct replacement gasket and coat it with a thin film of Chrysler Parts Division's Perfect Seal. This sealer will provide an initial seal when the engine is first started. In some cases, the service head gasket won't look exactly like the gasket you removed from the engine. If the new gasket does look different, don't worry about it. Just make sure the part number is correct. When the cylinder head is installed on the 273 and 318 engines, these two tangs will stick out from under the head at the front and rear. Don't cut them off or bend them over. They're part of the head gasket. Those tangs act as locators for the manifold side gasket and the end gaskets. The side gasket goes on first, and the sponge end gaskets on top of the side gaskets with the tangs sticking through the locating holes. You can make the job a little easier if you cement those end gaskets in place before you install the manifold. Use Mopar or Crico general purpose cement between the seal and the engine block. It's the same cement used to attach weather strips. Some of the old timers used to tie the head gasket in place with a piece of thread and let the thread crush into the gasket. Don't do it. That thread can be the start of a leak in a modern engine. I remember that one, Tech. And here's one for you to remember, Charlie. When the cylinder head goes on the block, dig out that service manual and pay close attention to the tightening sequence. If you don't, all the rest of your work is going to be wasted. I'll sure check them, Harry. And I learned the hard way about sticking to the torque specifications for tightening the bolts. Now, what about some of the other types of gaskets? Well, there are a lot of types, Charlie, so let's just look at some of the things to be careful about. One gasket we should look at is the cork type used on oil pans and valve rocker covers. Many times there's a strong temptation to reuse these gaskets just because they're not subjected to great pressures. That's bad news, so don't do it. And here's why. When you tighten a pan with a new cork gasket in it, the cork will be compressed as much as 50% of its original thickness. You may think that a used gasket still has a lot of compressibility, and maybe it does, but in spite of the remaining compressibility, there won't be enough elasticity to provide a good seal and you can't be at all sure of getting the gasket back in the same exact position. So, invest in a new gasket. There are some new gaskets on the market that retain elasticity during use, but the price of a new gasket is a pretty small insurance premium against a comeback, so don't use the old gasket. As with cylinder head gaskets, be sure all the old gasket material is removed from both the pan flange and its mating surface. You can scrape these surfaces, but be careful not to make any gouges or deep scratches. Check the flange of the pan for distortion and cracks. You can straighten small dents with a hammer and a block of wood. Here's a tip I picked up the other day, Harry. It's a way to look for small holes or cracks in the pan. Just turn the pan upside down with a light under it. The light will show through any openings in the pan. Of course, the pan should be cleaned inside and out so that any holes won't be hidden by dirt. That's a good idea, Tech. Always check the fit of a new gasket on the cover or pan. It's possible for even a new gasket to be stretched or shrunken in storage. To swell a gasket that is shrunk, soak it in water for a while. A gasket that is expanded can be shrunk by putting it in a warm, dry place. The warmth will contract the cork and pull it back into the correct shape. Should the oil pan or valve cover gaskets be cemented in place before installation? They don't need to be cemented, Charlie. And don't you ever use shellac on any of our gaskets. Right, Tech. Put a thin film of Chrysler Parts Division's Perfect Seal sealing compound on both sides of the gasket, and then put the gasket in place on the cover. The compound will help the gasket to seal, and it also helps to hold the gasket in position during installation. Tightening is very important on oil pans and covers, too. Over-tightening can cause enough distortion to develop a leak around the bolt holes. Here's a tip on gasket storage that can prevent a lot of trouble. Always store them flat on a shelf and keep them in their original containers. This is especially important for the cork gaskets. Right now, it's especially important for someone to turn the record.
I think you've covered the gasket story very well, Harry. Why don't you give Charlie the dope on seals? Sure thing, Tech. Most seal failures are caused by improper installation, so a good understanding of what a seal is and does is mighty important. Primarily, we'll be talking about two types of seals, the lip type and O-rings. Each has a specific function to perform, but basically they can be considered as closures. The lip type seal is designed to seal lubricant inside a bearing area and to keep dirt out of the area. The actual sealing job is done by a very small portion of the seal. Some flexible sealing members are spring-loaded and some are not. In either case, the sharp edge of the sealing lip hugs the shaft and acts like a squeegee, wiping the lubricant from the shaft. For some applications where there is a lot of dirt that can enter the sealing area, a double lip seal is used. The outer lip protects the inner lip from the dirt, so the life of the seal is increased. What kind of material is used to make a seal? It must be something with strong wearing qualities. That's right, Charlie. Seals do come in for a lot of punishment, even under the best of conditions. The most commonly used materials are leather and synthetic rubber. The leather is treated with a special compound to reduce porosity. Felt is also used in some applications. Felt is usually used in conjunction with leather or rubber seals to act as a dirt barrier. Because it is porous, felt isn't a satisfactory material for sealing in lubricants. I guess all O-rings are made of synthetic rubber. The O-rings you see are synthetic, Charlie. The type of synthetic varies between different rings, so they'll be compatible with a fluid to be sealed. Incidentally, a modern car uses about 40 O-rings. Right, Tech. And they do a really big job of sealing. Their shape makes them especially valuable for sealing high pressures under a variety of temperature extremes. O-ring applications are divided into two basic categories. Static applications mean that there is no motion between the two sealing surfaces. Dynamic O-ring applications mean that there is either rotating or reciprocating motion. The sealing ability of an O-ring depends on the amount of distortion it will take under pressure. The initial seal is formed by the squeeze between the two surfaces. Then, when pressure is applied, the ring is forced against the side of the groove. The force distorts the ring against the wall of the groove, forming a perfect seal. You can see that the size of the ring is a most important factor of its sealing ability. If the diameter is too small, the ring will leak, even at low pressures. A ring with too large a diameter will be hard to assemble, create high friction, and will soon wear out. So always make sure you have the correct size when replacing an O-ring. Some O-rings also have backup rings in the grooves. These rings prevent the O-ring from being extruded between the sealing surfaces under extremely high pressures. So don't leave them out during assembly. That's a good point, Tech. And that brings up another point. There are some ring-type seals that are not O-rings and that serve an additional function when pressure is applied. One of our disc brake assemblies uses a square ring seal on the pistons. This seal is designed to spring when pressure is applied, so when it comes back to its square shape, it also pulls the piston away from the shoe. I remember that one, Harry. Now I'm sure you have some good tips to pass on about seal replacement. That I do, Charlie. And even though most of them are based on plain common sense, they're still mighty important to doing a good job. First of all, if the job is just replacing a leaking seal, look the seal over carefully before you remove it. If you can see just where the leak is, it'll be a lot easier to correct the problem. Be extra cautious when you're removing the old seal. If you scratch the shaft or bore, the new seal will leak, probably worse than the old one. Use a seal removing tool to get the seal out of the bore. There are special removing tools available for some of the seals, but even if there is no specific tool, you can use a seal hook to pull the seal out. Don't ever let me see you trying to pry the seal out. You're almost sure to mess up the bore or the shaft. That sort of action is for backyard hammer mechanics. I won't forget that, Tech. Now, what are some of the things to look for after the old seal is removed? 
Well, there are a few things to look at and some things we can do to correct a bad condition. One item of major importance is cleanliness. A small amount of dirt or a single metal shaving will ruin a ceiling lip in no time at all. So clean up both the ceiling surface and housing bore before inspection. Check the bore for sharp edges and scratches. If the bore entrance has sharp edges, chamfer it with a scraper and smooth it with emery cloth. Smooth out the scratches, too. If there are any deep scratches in the bore, fill them in with gasket cement. Otherwise, the lubricant will leak out past the outside diameter of the seal. Examine the sealing area closely for nicks and scratches. A scratch will have small raised edges, which will cut into the seal lip and eventually wear it away. If you have to dress out the scratches, use number 600 emery cloth. It's fine enough to do the job without leaving any new marks. Thanks, Tech. Another thing you'll find on the sealing surface is a carbon buildup from the old seal. Be sure it's all removed so the new seal can seat properly. Check for sharp edges that might damage the seal during installation. You can use an oil stone to knock the edges off. When you're ready to install the new seal, examine it closely to make sure it hasn't been damaged in storage. The lip must be free of nicks or indentations, and the outer diameter must be true. Most seals are pre-lubricated before they're packaged, but before installing, coat the sealing lip with the same lubricant that it's going to seal. This will make installation easier and provide initial lube during the first few minutes of operation. Some double lip type seals come pre-lubricated with grease in the space between the lips. If you're installing one of these seals, don't use any additional lubrication. Coat the outer diameter of the seal with Perfect Seal Sealing Compound. This compound doesn't harden like cements do, and it's compatible with all automotive lubricants. Some of the seals we use already are coated with a sealer of plastic material. It's not necessary to use Perfect Seal Compound on these seals. Thanks, Tech. Installation of the seal is very simple if you use the proper tool for that particular seal. If you don't, chances are the seal will be distorted. If you have to use anything other than a regular installer, such as a socket or a piece of pipe, make sure the diameter is the same as the OD of the seal. If the socket or pipe is too small, the seal case will be distorted and you'll wind up with a leaker. Always protect the sealing lip when it's being installed over a shaft or when a shaft is being inserted. This is especially important if the shaft has splines, threads, or a keyway. If you don't have the correct size installing protector, wrap the splines or keyway with a piece of thin cardboard. A file card is just about the right thickness. There's a lot more to know about seals and their care, but I can see that Tech has that look in his eye again. You're right, Harry. Time is running out. So just let me throw in a final word or two. If you master technicians will read your reference books for this session, you'll find a lot of additional information on seals and gaskets. If you'll follow all of Harry's tips and use a little extra care during component assembly, you'll find that every job you do will have that something extra, the seal of approval. <laughs>